Almost 1,000 kilometres north of Brisbane, in the state of Queensland, lies the regional city of Mackay. It's a tropical climate ideal for growing sugar. In fact, this area produces more than a third of Australia's sugarcane. It's no surprise it's nicknamed the sugar capital of the nation. The Australian sugar industry is big and we have the potential to make it even bigger. We've been getting close to 80 to 100 tonne an hour, so pretty impressive for any bit of equipment. Between the three of us, there'd have to be 60 odd years of harvesting behind us, so if we don't know what we're doing now, we'll never know. Sugar is very, very big in Queensland. It's been around in Queensland for over 150 years. It has a very proud history. It's around about 850 kilometres of mainline track. GV 6085. We've got about 12,000 tonne of, uh, of cane turning up from the cane farms daily. What we have now is a climate and a focus on renewables. For Mackay Sugar, nothing is wasted. We're turning Mackay Sugar Cane into green power. We've received the vessel, the Sat Bellatrix. It's come from Singapore and it'll be here to load 26,000 tonnes of JA raw sugar. It's a good, honest industry. It's full of good, down-to-earth people. This is my patch of Big Australia. These farmers are resilient, facing plenty of obstacles. Floods, cane disease, fluctuating prices and changing regulations make it hard for many to stay afloat. And there's been an exodus over recent years. I like the farm. I don't like the economic pressures that come with it all the time, but I love the farm. We lost our water during this year because of um, local government sent a letter out to say, get your balls irrigation bores tested and then um, if you have a certain amount where well, you, you can't water for the next financial water year and then you've got to get your bore tested again. The worst thing is when the price of sugar really drops there's nothing else to back up the industry and the state of the mill suffers and, and that's when we lend ourselves to being taken over. There's been times that I can remember I thought, oh, this is the end for the sugar industry. Every day when something happens, you know, a lot of the times we wonder why we're here, and other times you enjoy it. It's a big challenge, but it's a challenge when you, when you win with it, it's, it's, it's great. It's like winning a lotto. Farmers are contracted to supply cane to sugar mills. Mackay Sugar owns four mills in Queensland. We produce over 800,000 tonnes of sugar per annum and we sell that through the domestic refining business in Sugar Australia as well as onto the export markets. Australia is one of the largest sugar exporting nations in the world. It produces up to a whopping 35 million tonnes of cane per year. 
processed, this equates to around 5 million tonnes of sugar. That's 25% heavier than the Australian landmark of Uluru. It also means Australia produces enough sugar to make more than 44 billion litres of soft drink each year. Australia's consumption is around 40 kilograms per capita per annum. And that is higher than the global average. And um, that reflects the fact that we're a, a developed economy and the buying power of the consumer here in Australia. One of the major uh, benefits of Australian sugar is, is our consistency and quality. We have a very high quality and our location to the markets. As you can appreciate, the Asian market is a significant market and it's, it's the area where sugar consumption is growing every year by about 6%. Around the country, thousands of sugarcane growers supply two dozen mills, which ship from multiple ports on Australia's eastern seaboard. Our major export destinations is fundamentally the Asia-Pacific region. A lot of sugar does go to Japan. Um, we also send sugar to places like Taiwan, uh, Korea, Thailand, uh, even some to New Zealand. And we're hoping to, to get between 1,700 to 2,000 tonnes per hour as a, as a throughput rate to load the ship. And we're hoping to do that within, within 20 hours. This is big business, and this year's harvest is set to begin. That is, until Mother Nature steps in to dampen spirits. Australia's farmland is spectacular. Lush growth and green fields meet the coastline and cane fields border townships like Mackay. The stacks that you see at the sugar mill have been focal points for many, many years. And uh, yeah, to, for us to keep uh, going, we need the sugar cane being grown out there. Sugar's been grown in, in Mackay for over 100 years and there's a great heritage here. Almost all of Australia's sugar is grown in the state of Queensland and Mackay is Australia's sugar heartland. But this beautiful country can cripple aspiring farmers. Rain is our enemy. They regularly face floods, or worse, cyclones, like this one which hit further north. The cane industry has also been devastated. The damage to the town as big a concern as damage to surrounding crops. Already the loss to the sugar industry will exceed a billion dollars. They've been hurt before by extreme weather and flooding. It's hard to bounce back from. Somehow farmers here will have to find the will to move on and rebuild. It is a promising crop this year, but now unseasonal rain has threatened the harvest. At the start of the season, we went pretty well. Had a, had a reasonable start to the season. Um, but then it rained, and it rained for, for a couple of weeks constantly. Mackay's three mills have been affected by the recent wet weather. All are experiencing downtime with not enough cane to crush. The weather in North Queensland can vary considerably. You can have very long dry spells, and we can have floods and cyclones. And, and even this year we experienced a, a tornado in Townsville, so that was, that was a new one for us. You're always looking up in the sky and see what the weather's doing every day. You, 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 with farm and you're relying on the weather a lot, eh? We're in the agricultural business and there's always uh, weather challenges. We faced significant interruptions to our harvest in 2010. And uh, again this year in July, we had three times the rainfall, which resulted in, in us having to stop in the middle of our harvest for over three weeks. It's not, a, not great for, for factories to be shut down for any length of time because it's very difficult to get them back up and running again. They've put everything out with the planting cycle, so it's, it's a bit of a rush from now to, to get it in. We just now have to catch up the balance of the season and we will also be crushing for longer. So we'll be harvesting all the way up until Christmas here in the Mackay area. The early days weren't easy either. While sugarcane was first brought to Australia on the first fleet, the first viable plantation wasn't established until more than 70 years later. Pacific Island labourers, named Kanakas, were brought in to work the plantations. 
some voluntary, some as slaves. In the early 1900s, Maltese and other Europeans migrated to Australia seeking a better life, many gaining work on labour-intensive cane farms. Cutting by hand was tough. And in the 60s, the writing was on the wall. Labour was getting expensive, and so machinery was developed to ensure a viable future and make things easier. Old technology did the job, but it's been usurped by mighty machines. High horsepower harvesters, worth around half a million dollars, now do the job of dozens of men. You would always know it was harvesting season in Queensland by the sound of cracking and burning over cane fields. But the industry has now largely moved away from this traditional practice, and the majority of growers now green harvest. Burning fires around, around the Mackay district, it's, um, there's very, very few farmers that do it. Um, it used to be a very common practice, but not anymore because of green cane harvesting. In Mackay, I suspect there's probably only three to four percent of the area that's burnt. Most people are 100% green harvesting for the benefits of creating that mulch, which can be up to 10 to 15 tonnes per hectare, onto the fields to suppress grass, keep moisture. It has been an absolute revolution. For the Blackburn family, burning is still the best way to run their business. Tonight, they're setting fire to prepare for the next day's harvest. If we cut a green here in the, in the trash, the ground goes too sour and the crop goes backwards, it won't grow. We won't get our full potential out of our land. A lot of people have lost the knack how to do it. You've got to have a lot of respect for it, but you can control the fire if, if it's dealt with in the right way. Australia's sugarcane is grown in high rainfall and irrigated districts along hundreds of kilometres of coastal plains and river valleys of the country's north-eastern coastline. Between Mossman in far north Queensland and Grafton in New South Wales, there are more than 4,000 cane farms in these areas. Often than not, sugar farms are family owned and operated. The Greck brothers are second generation farmers. That's Kevin. Yeah. When he was a young fellow, it was Je uh, Bark. Bark or whatever, or <laughs> Giraffe. <laughs> Brian is Brumby. And uh, yeah, they nicknamed me Chook. Mum and Dad sort of didn't push us into farming. We just grew up and loved it from the start. My first job was about seven year old. An old Massey 35 with the carry on the back, clearing new country for cane, picking up sticks. That's yeah. a funny thing, I was only thinking about uh, the other week, how we used to pick sticks and, and rocks. We never had a, a tip trailer to tip them off, so we were silly mugs, we used to hard work loading them on there, but then we had to unload them one by one again, instead of just mm. doing it the easy way, tipping it. But yeah, those yeah. sort of things toughen yeah. you up a bit, I suppose. This is where it all starts, the planting. It's a science based on placing the right cane variety in the right soil. The billets which are planted come from harvesting a field of cane, grown fresh from certified stock. All full of bullets at the back here. We've got elevating four feeding the cane up into the chute. And I've got to make sure there's no air pockets in the bottom here of the chute. Otherwise, if there's air pockets, that chain's got to be full of cane all the time. If it's not full of cane, that's when you get gaps in your drills, and that's what you don't want, you lose production. Within two to three weeks, the newly planted cane begins to shoot. The roots come out of there, out of here, and that's the eye, that's where the, the chute sticks up. That's where the cane comes up. That shoots out of the ground, then it just throws out other eyes, and it just that's how it makes a stool. That's how you get a stool of cane. That's how she all grows. It's hard yakker out on these farms, 
Not only are these brothers running their own farms, but they also contract to help others or take a second job to make a decent living. I'd rather stay on the land, but for me here, I've got a, the commitments go over the, to the mines and get that actually outside income to keep everything going, especially now that um, this farm's declared as a dry farm. A dry farm means growers can't irrigate. Government environmental regulations kick in when water salinity samples read too high. There's little warning and it can change everything. We lost our water during this year because of um, local government sent a letter out to say get your bulls, irrigation bulls tested and um, get it tested and they give, give you a printout of all the minerals in your bore and that. Yeah, if it's over that 1500 electrical, electrical conductivity, well you can't water for 12 months. Straight up it's a loss of income, depending on your, your rainfall, for right? rainfall mm. from the heavens above. Um, mm. If you get a good year you, you could fluke it, but there's, there's talk of the old dry cycle coming back, so yeah, you just got to pay by ear. Despite the constant challenges, Chook, Bark and Brumby wouldn't have it any other way. We're still together <laughs> after all these years. It's mm. going to be, take a bit to separate us. Also keeping it in the family are the Daguaris. I was one of number seven of seven kids and St Gerard's apparently the patron saint of mothers. So I say by number seven she needed a lot of prayers and so I'm sure that's why she named me Gerard. Mum and Dad were both born in Malta. They came over as 14 year olds, not together of course. And, um, and bo both came to the sugar industry. Mum with her family and Dad, his father was already here so he started uh, hand cutting cane with his father. Jerry hopes his boys can ride out the highs and lows of the industry. Son Joe wants to keep the farming tradition going. All my life I've been with Dad, just living the farm, dreaming about working on the farm, and um, I guess I've got the opportunity to be full-time on the farm now for the last four years. Yeah, I'm just happy, really happy to be given the opportunity. I love machinery, that's one thing growing up on the farm, so I really enjoy the work. I think that he's going to be a good farmer. It's only been a couple of years and he knows everything. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> yeah. I like to um, stir him up a bit sometimes and throw some different ideas in there. Everything I've ever thought is completely wrong. <laughs> no, we can honour right. You know, like one thing, I've never ever tried to just dictate and tell them anyone what to, you know, I like to learn too, and that's probably been more our downfall than anything. We've always been happy to try different things. We make some mistakes. We've been known to be the laughing stock of Mackay at failed ventures. We get the job done. And same as my brother, my brother looks after the fertiliser contract and I look after the harvesting contract. Together we all look after the farm and, and, and Dad oversees all of it. The day starts on the Deguara farm at 4.30am. They'll be cutting up to 100 tonne of cane an hour with these monster machines. Pretty impressive for any bit of equipment. 
the fuel can run anywhere from a litre to up to two litres per tonne of cane delivered on the line. And it's, it's a massive cost in the harvesting sector. They're just high horsepower machines. You know, they're putting 100 tonne per hour on the line and you just need, you just, there's no way out of spending the money on the fuel even though we don't like it. But I mean, that's just how it is. The, the machines are reasonably efficient. It's just that it's a big job to be done, you know? We're in here just adjusting the blaze cutter blades out of hole. Um, yeah, as you harvest, they, they wear down. So we try to keep them out as long as we can just helps us do a bit better ground job. We're all under a GPS guidance system, both um, harvester and haul out. That's to maintain us central in the road to um, assist in doing the yeah, best ground job we can. Look, in larger crops, it's um, yeah, it's a great assistance for us to try to see where we're going, you know, to know where we're going, rather than sort of, yeah, judging by feel. The Daguaris are glad to have the harvest season underway. They need to make sure it all goes to plan. There can't be any breakdowns, and the cane must efficiently and without delay make its way to the mill. the Guara farm, as the cane's cut, it spills into a truck known as a haul-out. There were only 22 of this type ever built in the world. The processed cane goes into a haul-out wagon. It has to be great teamwork because the machines don't have any storage as such. So for them to operate, they have to have a bin under the elevator. So that's where the timing is critical. If the, the bin boy's not in the right place, that's cane thrown on the ground, and the farmers don't like that. So it's very hard coordinating the speed, and, and you do harvest reasonably, you know, at high speeds, but between, you know, probably four to 10 kilometers an hour. The haul out takes its load to the nearby track, where the harvest is transferred onto the loco, ready for the mill. mill comes with their locos, takes them to the mill, and then the, the milling process begins. Our commitment is over once we put the cane and those bins on the line. Then the Mackay Sugar looks after that after that. Without an effective transport network to get the cane from the farms to the mills, Australia's sugarcane industry would grind to a halt. To get the sugar cane to the mill, locomotives are used to tow wagons. Each bin contains around five and a half tonne of cane. There is a staggering network of more than 850 kilometres of two-foot gauge track in the Greater Mackay area, servicing three Mackay sugar mills. Locos work 24 hours a day in the crushing season to keep sending empty bins out to the farms and full bins back to the mill. Steve Fisher is the transport supervisor at one of Mackay's sugar mills. With a career spanning 30 years, there isn't much he doesn't know about trains or what goes on on board. We're at the uh, Marion Mill receiving area for cane supply and we uh, supply cane here 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the crushing season. And we uh, roughly load out about 18,000 tonne a day of cane on a, on a good day. On a bad day, we'd like, we might get down to around about 13 or 14,000 tonnes. It's around about 850 kilometres of mainline track and it uh, covers them all, all areas, north, south, east and west. We've got uh, various sizes of locos. We start the small ones at 18 tonne locomotives, then we've got 24 tonnes. We uh, progress then to the ball ones, who so are 32 tonne ball ones, 40 tonne Imcos and the 94 class, which is a 40 tonne of train as well.
drivers, Cheryl and Dale, met on the job, and now their partners both on and off the track. Over the period of time they got together as, as friends and as mates, and then they become uh, a team on the locomotives. We met actually after my first year at working here. We met at our end of year breakup party. And now they're uh, a team at home as well. They become engaged. So that's a, that's a love story made on the trains. I tell Cheryl when they go out, the driver's always in charge of that train. So Dale's in charge. Okay, you got him. So my main job actually is telling him what to do. <laughs> No. It's a good team. A few little, you know, tips now and again, but all pretty good. <laughs> well, we do. <laughs> This is the nerve centre of the train network. It's like the big brother of the rail system, and it's where every train is monitored and tracked. This is the hub, yeah. This is where it all happens. It's very important. Without communication between traffic and the, and the locomotives, there'd be chaos out there. This is Carl and Loco with Cheryl and Dale on it. They're heading down back towards the mill with um, 190 full bins. So this being pretty much, yeah, the run's pretty much done for this, this round. We take it into the mill and uh, store this cane at the mill there. We grab empty carriages, empty bins, and then we come back out and do overnight deliveries. Officers at this central hub are on full alert. Anything can happen at any moment on one of these shifts. We have lots of trouble in the wet season because of uh, clay holes and uh, wet track and formation not holding up. Especially on these hills, it can be a bit dawning at times. We're in hilly country and when it rains, it can be a bit slippery. And we also have lots of trouble in the heat with uh, buckling rails and things like that. Keeps the mind ticking. Never a dull moment. The mill is awaiting the arrival of Cheryl and Dale's train. Locos arrive at the unloading facility adjoining the mill. This is where the load is weighed. The trains turn up uh, regularly during the day um, into the full yard, possibly around about 2,500 bins a day. We've got about 12,000 tonne of cane turning up from the cane farms daily for about 24, 25 weeks of the year. At the Weybridge, the cane comes in with the locos and it comes in in rakes. Those rakes are identified by the farm number and the farm number is then used to track the cane as it goes through the factory. The farmer actually gets paid on the weight that he sends in as well as the juice that's extracted out of that cane. Here, a high-tech hydraulic system is put to work. The Goliath is a, a huge bit of machinery that is electrically driven which pulls the rake of cane up onto the weighbridge and spots the bins onto the weighbridge so that they can be weighed. With the wet weather well and truly behind them, the cane is coming in thick and fast to the unloading area, ready for crushing and processing. The cost to the company with it when we shut down for this period of time with, when it's raining is, is huge. The real issue at the moment is that we need to get people back focused after the, after the shutdown because we are well and truly behind and uh, we need to catch that up. season is fully underway and the trains are making their way to Racecourse Mill. The mill needs to be ready for an onslaught of cane. It's all systems go to get the harvest off and the mill and refinery in full operation. In July we had three times the rainfall 
which resulted in, in us having to stop in the middle of our harvest for over three weeks. We just now have to catch up the balance of the season and we will also be crushing for longer. So we'll be harvesting all the way up until Christmas here in the Mackay area. The cane bullets are delivered by rail and weighed. Then they're dumped onto a conveyor belt and put through the crushing plant. The cane is shredded and then sent through six crushing mills, removing 98.5% of the juice, which contains the sugar. The juice gets clarified and the impurities are removed. It then goes through evaporators to remove the water, which then leaves a syrup. From here, the syrup is boiled under vacuum and crystals form. These crystals flow through a centrifugal stage and the final raw sugar is then dried and either sent to the refinery for further processing or trucked out for shipping. From each seven tonne of cane that actually arrives at the factory, we hope to make one tonne of sugar out of that. From the yard, the cane goes into a crusher, a huge rotating machine with more than 150 hammers, each weighing 28 kilograms, pounding the cane at 1,000 revs per minute. This just beats the cane into a pulp, still retaining the, the sugar juice into it. This is the start of the crushing process. Coming in at the top where there's a magnet that pulls any material off there that shouldn't go through the shredder. Coming down the feed chute, We are crushing the cane six times. Each one takes a little bit more of the, uh, of the sugar out of the fibre. The next process is clarification, where we remove the mud and any impurities out of the juice before it goes to the evaporation stage. This is where the, the juice comes through, it's picked up on a vacuum drum filter and all the sugar is sucked out, out and left the mud is left and that is then recycled back out onto the farm. So there's still a lot of fertiliser and goodies in it. We remove most of the water out of the juice and leave a product called syrup or liquor, which is the base for making sugar. Uh, this is the actual crystallisation stage of um, at Racecourse Mill and one of the operators checking to see what size grain in that pan. We produce the crystal simply by having a seed, which is a small seed crystal, and then growing it under vacuum and under heat for about four hours. Something similar to how we used to grow it at school. The school projects, we used to grow sugar crystals back in my day. Once the sugar has been made on the pan stage, we then move it to the centrifugals. We spin the centrifugals at around about 1,000 RPM. We make different brands of sugar by different lengths of time we spin for and also we wash it with hot water depending on what is needed for the markets. Adjoining Mackay Sugar's racecourse mill is a refinery. The refining process is all about removing colour and how we do that essentially we take raw sugar from the mills which looks like this and we turn it into refined sugar, which looks like this. Mm. 
the raw sugar from the mill next door is sent over in a crystallized state and melted to take out the color. Then it is re-crystallized. Sugar out of cane has to be processed several times to get it into a white state. And the amount of processing that the raw sugar mills will do will mainly bring it into what you see as raw sugar. It needs a further step to turn it into white sugar. And that's what we do in the refinery. The white sugar is not bleached. Uh, we do not do anything to cover or mask any of the color that is there. What we do is employ processes to remove the color from the sugar in the first place and then recrystallize the pure product as white sugar. Here, it's all about meeting strict quality requirements. For that to happen, we need to make sure that the whole process is enclosed and that there are no contaminants that can enter, the, enter, enter our process. For that reason, it, you can't see anything. It's, it's very enclosed and unlike a, a sugar mill which produces a more agricultural product. With the season delay, there's a race to ensure the sugar makes it to the packaging plant, located dockside about 15 kilometres from the racecourse refinery. This plant is packaging sugar at an extraordinary rate. We produce lots of different sizes of sugar bags, everything from one tonne flexible bags all the way down to 375 gram bags. In general, this packaging facility can produce up to 120,000 tonnes a year. Australia is a global sugar exporting giant and it's a major logistics operation to get this sugar shipped offshore. Shipping ports are scattered down the Queensland coastline. North of Mackay lies the city of Townsville, where exporter QSL is preparing to load another vessel. We received the vessel, the Sat Bellatrix. It's come from Singapore. It'll be here to load 26,000 tonnes of JA raw sugar. And we're hoping to, to get between 1,700 to 2,000 tonnes per hour as a, as a throughput rate to load the ship. The vessel loading process starts, starts in the shed, where front end loaders pick up approximately nine tonne buckets of, of raw sugar, tip it into the floor hoppers. Below the floors of the sheds, we have an underfloor conveyor system, which conveys the sugar up into the ship loader, and through a series of conveyors, we load sugar onto the, onto the ship. When we compare ourselves to a lot of the countries that we compete in sugar export, we can do it fast. We have the capability to, to store a lot of sugar. These are big sheds. We'll do between 35 to 40 sugar ships a year. It's a constant shipping process all year round. And we have built these sheds deliberately so that we can basically consistently and constantly export sugar. While ships are relentlessly loaded and head out for overseas and domestic markets, at Mackay Sugar's racecourse mill, they're powering forward. There's a big push to ensure nothing is wasted. So green, renewable energy projects are a big focus. The Australian sugar industry has an untapped potential in renewables, which we are now focusing on. And in the factory behind us, we've got a raw sugar mill, which uh, then leads into a sugar refinery, as well as a cogeneration plant which will power about a third of the electricity needs of this Mackay district. The big pile of fluff-like substance is called bagasse. It's the fibre left over from crushing the cane to extract sugar. It's also a biomass.
normally Mackay Sugar would uh, crush about, say, up to 6 million tonne of cane in a year. We would generate about 2 million tonne of bagasse from that sugar cane. So across our three factories, uh, it's about 2 million tonne of bagasse. And from an energy point of view, that's about equivalent to 700,000 tonne of coal. But of course, uh, the bagasse is renewable. Uh, it's treated as a renewable fuel, unlike coal, which is a uh, fossil fuel. What we have in the Mackay district is 72,000 hectares of cane, which is in effect one big solar panel, which captures the, the sun's energy, converts it into cane. We split out the juice and make sugar out of that. And the balance of that is the fiber. The project works like this. The gas is conveyed to the mill's boilers, where it's used as fuel for combustion to heat a water and produce steam. The steam drives a steam turbine connected to an electrical generator. The generator produces high voltage electricity, and this renewable energy is distributed to households via the Mackay electricity grid. In a year we'll push out about 200,000 megawatt hours of electricity into the local grid, and that will save about 180,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions into the Queensland atmosphere. So uh, yes, very, very significant from a renewable energy uh, project point of view. The other advantage to using the gas is that Mackay Sugar is carbon neutral. The CO2 from our bagasse, our fibre, is equivalent to the CO2 that's absorbed by the crop grown next year, which we'll harvest. So we're recycling our carbon effectively, so we are carbon neutral. Renewable energy is just one project on the Mackay Sugar List. We've got a 20-year plan in place looking at uh, other products, biofuels in particular, where we're looking at uh, the concept of making biodiesel from sugar. Uh, we're also looking at ethanol. So we've got a plan to diversify into uh, other areas as well as uh, just electricity. This is an industry forever renewing. As the world's appetite for sugar is increasing, Australia is a huge exporter and a highly competitive global market means it's had to get smarter. This is an industry of reinvention. From planting to harvesting, milling to refining, it is a constant challenge to compete to be one of the world's most efficient and innovative sugar producers. This is a story of evolution and it's a story that's not over yet. The Australian sugar industry is big and we have the potential to make it even bigger. We've got the port facilities, we've got the milling capacity, we've just got to put more cane into the ground. And I think we've got the opportunities right now with the sugar price where it is to take advantage of that and to add value so that we're not just reliant on sugar, but we have electricity and ethanol to support our base. Yeah, I love it. Like I said, I've come back, this is my seventh season back here. I do have an opportunity to drive, um, but while I'm DA on this train, on this run, and yeah, I love it. I'll stay as a DA. As a child of school, I grew sugar crystals. I'm still growing sugar crystals 40 years later. 40. How's that? <laughs> the good part of our farm here is the fact that myself and two sons can work together on a, a farm and get on and hopefully it'll be passed on to another generation and generation after that. There's nothing like being here in the sugar fields, it's a great life. Do I like sugar? My word, I like sugar. <laughs>